Hi guys, welcome back to Snakes and Adders Reptile Advice, episode 51. Uh, we're back to normal service now, so we've been doing some other bits where we sort of segue off and do things that we want to cover. But predominantly the, the reason for this series is for our subscribers on YouTube or our Facebook friends to ask us questions that will be of benefit to the community or that we can maybe help with and we answer them and we, we try and have a direct sort of communication with the people that have asked the question so today's question comes from Twin Raven uh, on YouTube what about brumation in snakes I know it's usually a given if you're breeding but what about with the average pet snake that you will never be bred are there significant health benefits to be had by putting your snake into brumation if I think of the Russian rat snake, its metabolism runs at a million miles an hour, but naturally it can brumate for four months or so in a year. In captivity, when not brumated, it would have no slowdown time. So would this have negative impacts on its long-term health, such as reduced lifespan? Great question. Fantastic question. Um, The problem that we've got is we're all preconditioned as pet keepers to be feeders. We want our stuff to be stocky and fat and well grown on and carrying the excess weight is, is part of the human condition to want to treat something really well. So it does run counterintuitive to potentially starve an animal um, for no other purpose than to make sure its weight is okay. It's interesting because predominantly when we think about brumation, cycling processes, the cooling down temperatures, all the rest of the stuff, it's usually very much with the specific aim of reproduction in mind. But if we consider animals that potentially come from particularly inclement climates and have incredibly harsh winters, are we doing them any favours by keeping them warm all year round? And I mean, even though the question is specifically about snakes, there are other examples that immediately spring to mind. So the, the, the most common species or group of animals that, that would this question be asked about would be tortoises. Do the European and um, Russian tortoises need to be hibernated? Throughout the year, they are storing fats and lipids around the body ready for a period of inactivity uh, and zero food intake and they would metabolize these fat stores to keep themselves going until more even temperatures returned if we're keeping them in captivity and we do not offer them the opportunity for them to um, metabolize these lipids do they continue to store them well the answer is yes so you know I've, I've read and heard that you know the expected lifespan of say a tortoise that's brumated properly allowed to go through this fat burning cycle versus a tortoise that's just kept warm all the time and fed around the clock or even though it will naturally slow down or want to slow down um, the lifespan can be literally you know 25-30% of that of the of the animal that was brumated so you know a a, a brumated animal will will live 80 years a non-brumated animal might live 20 25 and more than likely it's going to be uh, obesity and complications of lipid storage within the body tumors cancers because it's the perfect breeding ground particularly around the renal system uh, it ties into something else which is potentially the use of uh, dietary based vitamin d uh, which could cause fatty liver disease um, but that's, that's a separate issue another example would be we had a, a, one of our customers in the other day who keeps leopard geckos and we were talking about fat pockets forming under arms and, and it was I'd, I'd seen this question I'd not had time to respond or even formulate it but I spoke to this lady for a good 10-15 minutes about <clears throat> We know that leopard geckos occur halfway up a Afghanistan, Pakistan mountain range where they're very exposed 
and no doubt in summer it's blazing hot and they're going to hide away most of the time we know they're crepuscular so they're dawn and dusk but they're going to have a pretty harsh wind and there's going to be some pretty severe frost maybe even some snow really high up in these mountains so these geckos would then store the lipids in their tail all, their, all, all throughout the year to then potentially go through a period where they have to lean up and they can't feed. They're not particularly basking and they're just waiting this out. But in captivity, that's not a species that we really see that done with. And obesity in leopard geckos is rife because we're feeded. feeders. We're preconditioned to feed up our animals and make sure that they're as chunky as possible. And they're probably one of the prime examples of where we maybe overdo it. And would we be doing our animals a favour by allowing them to brew mate? I mean, this is all conjecture, it's opinion. I'm not, I'm not necessarily stating this as fact. I'm thinking out loud, if you like. When I used to speak to Chris Matterson, who was a, uh, an author in the UK, he lived in Sheffield, um, he said that he had produced Mountain Kings and the Mexicana Kings, and quite often... The babies were very reticent to begin feeding and he said I just brumate them what do you mean you brumate them they've never fed yeah don't worry about it they're fine born with big yolk sacks put them through a brumation make them think that they've gone through a winter and in the spring they're ravenous and they just kick in feeding so there's techniques there there's there's tricks that people have picked up that maybe have either been lost through time or never really adopted the problem we've got, obviously, we've got a sliding scale of breeding um, generations within the hobby. And the, the more generations deep we go, the less these variables seem to matter. Take, for example, corn snakes. The original stuff will have been brumated to get it to breed. Now, you introduce a male and female corn in spring, and they're, they're at it. They don't need any triggers. But again, that's down to breeding. It's not necessarily talking about health choices. So what we can do is we can find that we have animals that may stutter with food intake quite seriously and it stresses us out. And then we, are we going to improve appetite by trying to force them to stay warm and keep feeding them? Or should we give them the winter that their body clock seems to be telling them that they want and then forcing a two, three, four month break and then reinstigating the feeding. And there's a lot of people that keep the weird colubrids. Well, when I say weird colubrids, they're not weird at all, but by today's standards, they are weird. In my mind, they're just old school snakes. But um, things like Aesculapian rat snakes, uh, leopard snakes, uh, dice snakes, uh, viperine water snakes, Dionys rat snakes, they refrigerate them. I'm not joking. They give them a period without feeding to make sure that their bowel is completely clear of any waste, any um, fecal material or urates. They, you know, they, they're rinsed out. They've been given baths and tried to make sure that their bowel is completely clear. Then they begin the cooling down process. We mustn't begin the cooling down process while there's still food in there because potentially it will rot or there'll be problems. So the tract must be clear. They begin their cooling down process, get them as cool as they can over a period of, say, four weeks in a room, taking them down off their heat, down to room temperature. They may be migrating through places within the room, down to floor level where it's at its coolest. They move into a cooler room, let the process take place again, and then getting them in a, a completely unheated room as winter approaches and then finally into a refrigerator where they may spend two or three months at between five and seven degrees celsius so the fridge is usually turned to like number one on its little internal stat so it's just ticking over not not at the highest setting we don't want it too close to freezing but cold enough for these animals to be able to fall asleep they're then inspected maybe once a week every 10 days maybe allow them a little drink and then they go back in so this is a process that they go through every year and this is one to safeguard health but also to safeguard appetite so it might seem counterintuitive to those of us that are pre-programmed to be feeders why is my snake not feeding but in actual fact <coughs> An enforced brumation without breeding as our primary driver can be equally as beneficial to our animal's life cycle 
and does it need to just stop with the animals that we see as particularly hardy or affected by winter such as these like northern european um colubrids or should we extrapolate that out and think actually you know the natural range of the bearded dragon is from alice springs almost to the tip of adelaide so it's like a big oval so Begona viticeps has got a really wide range and actually in the southern parts of its range it's going to have quite a serious winter. If we think about leopard geckos due to elevation in Afghanistan and Pakistan, are they going to have quite a serious winter? Would it benefit them to have an enforced period of inactivity where they metabolise all of this fat, or not all of it, but a fair proportion of this fat, and maybe their tail shrinks a bit, to then prepare them in spring to re-add that weight? The problem is we're always seeming to be in a rush to get our snakes as big as possible, as quick as possible, and people pump their animals full of food. And then we we almost get taken by surprise that we've created an obesity problem. See, you're taking one of nature's most efficient animals, filling it with food, and then when you've gone too far, it's almost it's not impossible, but it's a nightmare to get that weight back off them. It isn't as anywhere near as easy because they're designed to store it. So actually, probably one of the best uh, fat metabolizing processes is going to be to put them through a brumation if that's part of their natural cycle. Obviously, the animals within the tropics or, or equatorial regions aren't going to have this process. So it's not for them. It is for animals that would have a quite serious winter. And then at which point do we respect where animals are naturally from? And that's what it so this question sort of alludes to. If we are pet keepers and we've done our research, we've looked at the country of origin, we know what the climate data would say for the country of origin. And then if we just keep them at 30 degrees all year round, actually we flying completely in the face of what is common sense. Um, and the argument has always been, well, if you're not breeding them, don't bother. But now as we get more developed and we, 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 we learn more about the reptiles that we keep, and, and there's a lot of keepers that are already clocked onto this and already do these brumation processes. But I'm on about them, the layman, jack of all trades keepers who don't really necessarily apply a huge amount of thought to this sort of stuff. But as a fat burning process for your animal, if it's a temperate species, would it benefit from an enforced uh, nil by mouth? Now, they come with consequences, these things. If an animal is hungry or it's back on its food, we could potentially expect more territoriality and more aggression. We could expect maybe slightly different uh, personality traits to become shown as we put them through this process. And then, is that an issue? So it's now a balancing act between the long-term health benefits of an enforced brumation process versus your experience of keeping the animal that's been put through a brumation process and is it going to be crankier as a result because it's come out of brumation it's not eaten for three and a half months and it might be in a rather bad mood. And it's then deciding which is more important. Now, obviously, temperament is a sliding scale and with human interaction can be improved. But you can expect a marked difference between the snake that goes into hibernation and the one that comes out the other side, simply because there's, there's so much hunger and there's been four months to forget about you. And obviously, when it's cold in the fridge and it's coming out for a drink, it hasn't got the energy to have a go at you because it's in shutdown mode. So, you know, this is... This is um, it's, 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 it's interesting, it's, it's, I think it's a brilliant question. And what I would desperately like to know is people that keep maybe some of these um, hardier temperate species that go through brumation process, what's your process, how long does it last, what temperature do you take them down to? How much time do you allow for them to clean out their bowel? Uh, how long do you take about raising them back up to full temperature? What's the total from end of feeding to next feed? and that brumation process. People that do brumate their animals that aren't traditionally brumated, people that would enforce a brumation for a bearded dragon, enforce a brumation for a leopard gecko, these animals that potentially people just feed all year round and don't really commit that much thought to it, but in actual fact they, are, they probably do go through 
quite a, a winter, particularly the southern regions of the Pagona Viticeps range and the leopard geckos will do as well because that's a seriously harsh environment that they naturally occur in. I hope you find that interesting. It certainly provoked my me thinking and you know I know I may have rambled slightly but it's this is what this these videos are about. I'm not necessarily appearing on a video going the answer is it's more like hmm let's have a think about this and and, and spitball and that's kind of the whole process of the of this series. Um, so join in, have your say, give us a like, comment or and share or share and uh, me and Paul at Snakes Nadders. We'll see you soon. Peace.